this webinar will be recorded. So as we go through, uh, just know I will record this and we'll post it up on the State Department website so you guys can refer back to it. And so let's go ahead and look at today's agenda. So we'll talk briefly about the purpose of evaluation and then we'll kind of talk, okay, then we'll talk steps for evaluation and qualifications for evaluators. I have a few resources for potential evaluators and then what the request for proposal for those evaluators will look like and then I have some independent evaluation guidelines and then we'll open it up for questions and answers. So, looking at it, evaluation is asking and answering important questions your program and youth you serve. So, really the purpose of the, this third year independent evaluation is to get an outside look of what your program has done uh, and how it is aligned with your original grant and ultimately you want to show whether or not your program has met the measure of effectiveness, which are those things that you, one, wrote in your pro project design and your principles of effectiveness, and two, looking at statewide and local objectives. Um, and then ultimately your evaluation wants to provide recommendations and plans for continuous improvement. So that's kind of the big picture of why we do this third year evaluation and ultimately I hope that it helps you guys to be able to see where your strengths and weaknesses are, reflect on those, and then make improvements to better your program. You know, another purpose of the evaluation is help to disseminate information about your program to your guys' local communities, to the State Department of Education, and to your parents and staff that you guys serve. So, here's kind of the steps for the evaluation is one, really determining the purpose of your evaluation. And of course, uh, through the U.S. Department of Education, we have a couple of guidelines or recommendations for that purpose, but ultimately we want you guys to drive this evaluation. You know, each program is unique, and so we want to see that in the evaluation so that I don't want to just put one hat on everybody and say, oh, this is exactly how it should look. Because each of you guys serve different groups of kids and, uh, and you guys have different designs, models that you guys follow and so forth. So really think about what your purpose is, what you hope to get out of it. You know, and that could be in terms of what is our impact on youth compared to non-after school participants. Or it could be, you know, overall, how are we helping the community provide more enrichment, academic learning opportunities for, you, for our youth, and so forth. The next thing would be is developing those evaluation questions. So these would be kind of big picture questions, and as we get into it, uh, in the guidance section that I have, I have some sample questions. But ultimately, you're looking at, you know, do youth benefit from your program? Are they satisfied with your program? You know, questions like how are you benefiting from your services that you guys are providing and what evidence can you do, what evidence can you provide that they've benefited? And so that could be, you know, on an academic base, looking at ISAT or local uh, assessment scores. The next thing in your evaluation process is deciding who will do the evaluation. And so that's looking at that independent evaluator and what services they're going to bring to the table and what depth of an evaluation that you, you want. Uh, fourth on the list would be developing a data collection system. So one, we do use COBRO consulting to track student participation, uh, family engagement, and staff training. And so that would be one system, but we could also look big picture of you know, collecting data based off of surveys of students, parents, staff, community members, as well as other uh, indicators that you guys collect on a local level that we don't necessarily require. And that could be, 
you know, data collection of school day attendance, behavior referrals, uh, things like that. And then the last step in the evaluation, again, is exploring and making sense of all the data, really driving it in to see what influence you're having in your program and how you can use that data to make improvements or really show your strengths. So a big thing is, is looking for the qualifications for evaluators. And I know this is a difficult one because uh, we just don't naturally in Idaho have a whole lot of resources to go to with people that have 21st after school experience. However, you're looking for an independent evaluator, which is somebody who is outside of your fiscal agent and in partnership. And then, of course, addressing anything of conflict of issue would eliminate them. And that could be, you know, 21st century participants or staff. So unfortunately, we asked if directors from other programs could evaluate your program, and the answer is no. So we couldn't have Coeur d'Alene evaluating Pocatello. Um, other things in conflict of interest are those that are directly involved in programming, those who have financial gain, you know, so, so they're either already contracted to provide a different service to your program, or they have reasonable other motivations for the outcomes of the evaluation, which could be things like their relatives or um, have a direct community interest in your program. So look at those things for conflict of interest. And, and I know, you know, as we look at it big picture, a lot of programs will probably turn towards the universities and colleges in our state because they tend to have staff that are qualified with for evaluations and they have the education uh, experience both education as an evaluator and education in the world of education. Does that make sense? I hope so. Uh, and, and so you might have somebody like, oh, Boise State partners with NAMPA. However, Boise State would still be able to evaluate the program in Twin Falls. So you, so you just might have to think outside of your direct community. So it's like, oh, if you do partner with this university, you might want to look at a different university. Um, so again, we're looking at an evaluator with experience with evaluations and experience with either after school, education, and or youth programs. So Andrew, one of the questions that we've had about that that um, I'm sure some of the directors will have is, can one director go and evaluate another program? And the answer to that is no. So right here uh, on bullet point two in conflict of interest, you can see the 21st CCLC staff cannot evaluate other programs. So a director cannot be contracted to evaluate another director. And let me also throw out as we go through this, if you have questions, feel free to type them in and uh, I'll kind of weave them in as we go. Most of the questions I'll probably address at the end. However, if it's relevant, I'll try and get to it as soon as we can. So that's kind of the qualifications we're looking at for evaluators. So I have a couple of resources here. Um, you know, looking at potential evaluators, like I said, is really look at the university professors and or graduate students that are going into evaluation. Um, also the American America Association America Evaluation Association, they have listed um, evaluators, and let me pull this up. And so when you pull up the website, you know, you would go to the evaluation listing, and you could see, you could either search it by topic or by geographical area. And so if you click on Idaho, you know, we now have, there's three people on this that um, are on here. Most they're all based out of the Treasure Valley. However, um, Scon, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, research and evaluation. They have experience. They do education-based research for informal education centers. So that could be relatable to us. So that could be one person that you reach out to. Uh, 
The other thing is, is I also put in, uh, this is Washington. Here's their 21st CCLC evaluator list. And so it's based off of the same um, American Evaluation Association. However, they've gone through and identified key people who have evaluation experience in education and or 21st specific. And so you might want to check out that link. I will also send this PowerPoint to you and so you can dive more into that. And I know for the Washington list, it might be more applicable to our northern region one, region two programs, but it could still be something that you reach out towards. And, and hopefully as I go through this, you know, if um, as programs develop who their evaluator is, I might push it out, you know, if anybody's struggling to find an evaluator to other people and we can close the gap that way. Or of course, you guys can contact each other and see who you have as an evaluator. So request for proposals. So next year, those grantees that are entering their third year of programming, they'll be funded at 90% of their original award. So that remaining 10% may be used for an independent evaluation. However, a subgrantee does not have to use the full 10%. You just have up to that 10%. And really it will depend on the services and the depth of the evaluation that you're requesting from the evaluator. And to give an ex example, if you want, you know, if you're requiring your evaluator to do 18 on-site observations, that's obviously going to cost more than just doing two on-site observations. You know, so it's really going to be able to, it's really going to depend on the depth that you guys want your evaluation to be. However, you can see the more involvement that the evaluator has, the more depth they could provide about the program. You know, that if they attended the program 18 times, they would give a more accurate description of what it looks like, other than, oh, I came once and that was it. Um, and then I'm going to tweak this a little bit, but I'll show you this. So we also have a sample RFP. Uh, and I hope, let's see, a, a sample RFP. So this is the one that, that we sent out for um, soliciting bids for our data collection, reporting, and evaluation services. I don't think they're going to be able to see that because oh. you only shared that one item. I could be wrong. Oh, yeah, yeah okay. you're good. Okay. All right. Uh, so yeah, so this is this is a you know, and it's kind of the RFP will have a purpose. You know what you're looking for, and I'll like I said, I'll tweak this a little bit for you guys to have a template of oh, we're looking for an independent evaluation, the background of the requirement. You know, we're a federally funded program, and this is the way that we show the effectiveness of our program, and then the scope of the work. And so obviously, on here, you won't be looking at specifically somebody providing a data collection system because we already have that, but the evaluation requirements. And I'll give you some bulleted guidance uh, that's in the third year evaluation guidance document that you guys can use, but it's up to you to tweak it as you guys see fit. And so scoping that of what you want the evaluation to look like and then um, of course, the experience of the evaluator and then how you're going to review the proposals, you know, kind of what's the criteria of what you're looking for. So what I would recommend is to create one of these, you know, post it on your district's website or figure out a way to disseminate the information about this evaluation, you know, and whatever it is that your district does of, oh, we're going to post it for two or three weeks and see which request the proposals come in. And then, of course, I would probably branch you out and contact people of interest, say, oh, I have this evaluation process. Would you be interested in submitting an RFP? You know, let them know. Let them decide. They send it to you of what they're going to do, their qualifications, you know, their price range of what it's going to cost, and so forth, and then you select the best one.
So looking at the independent evaluation, so here's kind of the evaluation outline. Is uh, the State Department, we're looking for, you know, kind of four sections, which includes background information. So this is, you know, pretty much the information of the evaluator and then your program, mm -hmm. you know, how many staff, how many students, all that type of stuff. And then bullet point number two is the evaluation method. Then bullet point number three is the evaluation findings and recommendations. And then bullet point number four is using the evaluation. And so, you know, you'll, I would say that the programs, the, the directors will have involvement in each of the stages. But really, stage four will be your main involvement using the evaluation because that's how you'll show, uh, you know, you'll provide a narrative of how you're going to disseminate this information or how you're going to use this evaluation to improve your program. And uh, so that'll lead me to here. So I have created, because I love creating documents, as you guys know, I have created this guidance for independent evaluation. And so kind of an introduction of what the evaluation is, you know, uh, looking for an independent evaluator. And then here's, here's the key thing is this outline of like what I said. So you, section one, background in, information will include, you know, what year was the evaluation, program description, uh, program rationale, and so forth. Then section two was the evaluation method. So what questions are you guys addressing in your program? You know, what are you looking to answer? And then how you came about. And of course, I provided a couple of sample questions that you could use or that I would like to see um, addressed. And you can add your own as well because maybe you have something more specific that you would like to focus on in your program. And then, you know, what types and sources of evaluation data. So that could come from uh, performance data based off of ISAT, IRI scores, uh, local assessment data, or COBRO consulting or our Compass system data. It could come from survey data of parents and students and staff. And then, of course, obser observation data. So that's the evaluator sitting in the program and observing what's going on. Uh, and then section three is looking at the evaluation findings. So presenting the data and then making recommendations based off of what the data shows. And then section four, like I said, this would be your, your component to this, is how you're going to utilize this evaluation to help improve your program. And then reflect, you know, I mean, reflecting on how you're going to uh, improve your program pr practice to better service your students. And, and for me, I think this is a strong one that really you guys could utilize this, this evaluation to show your advisory boards, your school boards, your community members the effectiveness and the importance of your program. You know, because a lot of times these types of things will speak harder to people where you'll be able to show like, oh, here's the data. You know, here's some anecdotal stories of how we've made changes. And, and I'll tell you, I've heard some great stories as I've gone out and listened to um, site, mo or as I've done site monitoring visits and listened to the staff of what you guys have done. And some of it's really heartwarming. And so it's like, oh, you can put some of those stories into this evaluation and show how we've made a change. And then, of course, if you want, you can attach appendices, appendixes as you guys see fit. You know, so observation records, um, surveys, testimonies by staff, students, parents, and so forth. And then at the bottom, I included a couple of resources to help you guys, you know, some research articles on evaluation for after school programs, and then some examples of other states' evaluations. And so let's pull like this up real quick. And so this is <clears throat> Uh, this is the West Valley uh, Partnership Community Center, and they house 21st grants in, in Utah. And so 
This is what their evaluator did. And of course, they have a huge program. You can see this is all the elementary schools that they have in their program. And then they went through, and here's the key findings, here's the recommendations, you know, and then here's some student surveys and what did, or student responses, teacher responses, parent responses, and what were the findings in there based on all the, uh, all the schools. And then it just kind of goes through. So of course, you guys can look at this, your evaluator can look at this, and kind of help draft models based off of this and the other um, examples that I provided. The, the other resource I will share with you is here's a whole chapter on evaluation guidelines. You know, so it's like a, doing this e independent evaluation of how to do surveys uh, and how to work with your evaluator and so forth. So that is all I have about evaluations. Big, big picture, some of it, you know, like I said, I'll send out these emails to those who participated today of the resources, and you guys will have that. It'll include this slide, the guidance form for third year evaluations of kind of what I went through of looking at um, what we expect to see, you know, each of the sections, and then the resource for the list of the Washington American Evaluation Association and that Chapter 5 evaluation guidance. Yeah, and ultimately I, I think I think this is going to be some work and, you know, I mean, Again, Idaho, this is the first year we're going to do it, so it'll be a learning experience. But ultimately, I think that having a good evaluation system can help us, one, make that case for our communities of the importance of after school, show what we're doing, and then two, it'll also help us, us at the State Department, be able to see what your guys' evaluations show and find common indicators amongst all the programs. You know, and that, that's a big thing because right now it's like, oh, we kind of, you know, make decisions and, and think, oh, let's have this as our goal and everybody will follow that. But really we want you guys to find your, your needs in your communities and do that and then we'll find those common, common areas. So I'm open for questions. One question that came up. Can I make this bigger? I think if you... If you yeah, double click on the questions and it will pull it out into a separate box. Uh, okay. So one one question is when is the deadline for this? This would be June thirtieth, two thousand seventeen. So this would be submitted with your next year's annual performance report. Yeah, double click on where it says questions. Right there, and it should pull it out into a separate box. Oh, it just goes like that. Huh. Oh, right here. Got yeah, there you okay, go. perfect. Now I can see. Uh, perfect. So far, all the questions have been about due dates, so that makes it easy. June 30th, 2017. So the next question is: Is how do we pay the evaluator? So I'll I'll take this one. Um, at this point. Be for tracking purposes, we have to show separately within the grant reimbursement system what was grant funds, which would be 90% of your award, and what was evaluation funds. So right now the plan is that we would award your 90% award in the GRA first, and then once we have your um, approved RFP, your, um, we know how much you're, you're going to pay your evaluator we would actually most likely put that into the GRA as well, but I haven't verified all that with our fiscal and accounting system. But it, it will be done most likely similar to how you do it right now. It will just be two separate awards to show the difference between your actual grant award and then this 10% for the evaluator. 
So hold tight on that, but uh, you know, the yes, so to answer the actual question, does the district pay them? Yes, you would pay them, and then you would be reimbursed by the State Department of Education, just like your grant funds are used now. And then on to add on to that, on your level, in, in drafting the contract with your evaluator, one, I'll make the recommendation to have specific deliverables. So, so you could break it up into, oh, they'll give, you know, one payment halfway through and then one payment when it's finished. But make those specific deliverables of like, okay, so once all the teacher, parent, student surveys are finished, we'll send an invoice and we'll have one payment of X amount of dollars. And then once the total report is finished, we'll have the next invoice of the rest of the sum. So really just focus in uh, on those deliverables. And so you could do it in one lump sum if that's what you and the evaluator choose to do. But again, just if you do one lump sum, oh, here's going to be when that final report is finished, you can now send an invoice and we'll pay you. But if you want to break it out, you can do that as well. So there's a question about if the cost uh, if the cost of the evaluator isn't the full 10%, will we get the remaining back? The answer is no. That is why we'll we'll need to see how much you have agreed to pay your evaluator. And then we also would encourage you when you put these RFPs out, quite often they'll come back and they'll say, "How much do you have to spend?" And we encourage you not to tell them that you know, if you have a hundred thousand dollar award and so you have ten thousand to spend, they will bill you, I mean they will come up with a project that will use up your entire ten thousand, whether it's actually the most effective program or not. So uh, you know, give them a ballpark of what what you plan to spend, but um, you can we will only reimburse you up to the ten percent and no you will not receive into your program the additional amount that is not spent. Hopefully that answers your question. And I don't really understand this one, financial gain. So Lori's asking, um, in the conflict of interest, you, we listed uh, financial gain as a conflict of interest. Um, yes, Lori, we are paying them, but what that means is if, if like you, you are looking at somebody in your brother-in-law, and it's a financial gain for them to, to be the evaluator. There's the other conflict of interest that it's your brother-in-law. You can't use him. I see. And, and also another thing would be is finan so financial gain is if I'm paying 4-H to come in and provide services to the program, so they're my contracted group already for the program, and now I'm paying 4-H as my evaluator. Where it's just like, oh, 4-H has invested to give me a good evaluation because they already have that partnership and they're already getting a stipend amount from 21st. I was just thinking when it said financial gain, it was an organization because the G was capitalized. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Here's, here's one that hasn't popped up, but it has popped up amongst you guys of when should this start. I would, I would highly recommend that you start this sooner rather than later. And, and we would really like to see the contract being made right there in the early fall because the evaluators are going to need time to do the evaluation and get everything going. So if you wait until March to do this, there's just, you're not going to get a good solid evaluation. So the next question is, 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 it, requ is it required to uh, bid this out via RFP? The answer is yes. Uh, of course, you know, I mean, if, like I said, if you already have an organization in mind, you know, it's like, oh, they can submit an RFP and then you can take the other ones and evaluate it, and that's okay, and you just choose 
the one that's best for your program, which fits, you know, fiscally, which one comes the best for the price and the services that they're providing. So we know when we initially added this to your grant competition, the question that was in the grant competition said, um, identify somebody that you might work with. Um, but we made it really clear not to enter into any agreement that they would be the evaluator because we didn't have the requirements put in place yet. Uh, and, and so we asked you to hold off on actually entering into that agreement. Because this is quite a bit of money, uh, it may not seem like it's a lot when you're dealing with you know, a $160,000 grant, but to some organizations this is a lot of money. And so we need to make sure that we are using it to the best. Uh, of our ability and that you're getting the best service possible. So by putting it out on an RFP, that opens that door and allows other people that you may not have thought of to come to the plate. You may still initially go with that person that you had the initial conversation with, you know, th almost three years ago, but you need to open it up so that other people can have the opportunity to bid. It will make it, it's a best practice, you guys, it gets you out of trouble of uh, saying that we're always going with this one company. Um, so. so the next question uh, is, is there a certain number of bids that we need to put out or that we need to receive? And the answer is no. I mean, if you post your RFP for a certain amount of time, two weeks or three weeks, whatever your district policy is or whatever their normal procedure is, then that is suffice for us. The, you know, we don't need you to keep bringing it out to find more bids. It is what it is. This does not start for round eight grants. So this is starting for, oh wait, yeah, so just round nine, mm -hmm. which is currently in year two. And so the round nine grant will be the first year, um, third year evaluations are required. And then it will be going forward. So any anybody who's funded after round round nine and after that will have to have a, a third year evaluation. However, it is a you know it's a great practice if you have the money in your budget. Absolutely, um, we have a few programs around the state that that evaluate the program every year. I. Uh. So if, if you're on the call and you're around seven and around eight grants, you know it's not required for you to do this. Any other questions? Okay, I have a couple. I'm going to try something new here. I hope it works for me. How does this work? There was a question that popped up right oh. as you were. Uh, where did my question thing go? Go, go back to your. Oh, where did it go? Sorry, you guys. We're getting better at these. <laughs> go up to your view. Go up to your view tab. And click oh, the question again. Is. Okay. Um, I would say yes. Andrew and I were talking about this this morning. Um, so the question is, the entire RFP process is new to us. Would my district be able to help me with this? I can't off the top of my head identify other programs that use evaluation uh, within the district, but I'm going to say that there are others. And so yes, absolutely. Uh, if you have a purchasing office or your business manager, go talk to them and ask them if they're paying another evaluator, if they're, um, if another program is using an evaluator. Ask if you have access to your administration, such as your superintendent. They would probably be aware of stuff. Off the top of my head, I can't think of anybody, any other programs directly that are required to do this, but we'll continue to ask around the office and see what we can find and get back with you. So I have a question for you guys real quick. If, if you already have a potential evaluator in mind, would you raise your hand?
Would you be willing to list in the question comment box who that is? Okay, next question. If you feel overwhelmed and frazzled by this whole process, will you raise your hand? Okay. Uh, if you feel if you feel like you have a good handle, like if you have, you know, we have some insight of what to do, and there still is, you know, some gaps you need to fill, but overall you feel comfortable with this, will you raise your hand? All right, so are there any other questions or concerns? Okay, it looks like that is everything. And again, feel free to okay, feel free to contact me as uh, this starts to unravel, and if you have more questions and I concerns, ideas, you know, if you just want to brainstorm, I can help you through this process. And again, I would really recommend that you uh, utilize your district staff and have them be involved in this, not in the actual evaluation, obviously, but, but helping you guys find the resources and figuring this out as well. Uh, if, and the other thing I'd recommend is Look at my resources that I send you once this is over of the guidance, the presentation, uh, the examples of other states' evaluations of their programs, um, and then the research on how to do effective evaluations. So that is all I have. So, so we do not need three bids. You just need to send out that RF, that request for proposal, so an RFP, and that would just be posting it that you're looking for a contracted service of the evaluation. Um, if you get three bids, perfect. But there's probably a good chance that you're not going to get three bids, so it's not required. The the thing is, is I would say just make sure that you document you know, how you went about this process and how long you left the RFP, the request for a proposal on your website or, you know, whatever internet tool you use or newspaper ads you use, things like that to push the information out there. Your your district will will have a process on how they have to go about request for proposals. So follow your district policy. All right. Well, everybody, thank you guys very much for attending. And I just wanted to think in my head real quick to make sure that I covered everything that I wanted to cover. So with that, have a great Memorial Day weekend and enjoy yourself. Thanks, everybody.